Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Everybody depends from where you are joining. So welcome back to our October, first October session in Stuttgart Power Platform User Group. So uh, just for everybody's information, so we'll be recording the call and you can later on find the recording on Power Platform User Group channel uh, in Germany. And uh, also on a meetup page, you can find all the relevant information about upcoming sessions and uh, what's what's new and what's going to come. So just a few short introduction. Christian is here. Christian, you're on mute, by the way. I'm Augustin. Christian is also here. And uh, we'll be hosting you as pretty much every time. And just before we start with today's session, uh, let's announce what's coming up in October. So October is fully packed. So each and every Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. it's packed. So next week it's Ferenc Onka from Hungary talking about XMLA read write endpoints. Also on 20th of October, Daniel Otikier about jumping in and explaining tabular editor with the main focus on tabular editor three. So which will be a good experience for pretty much everybody because it's a new tool, although it's commercial. And Daniel will speak about uh, comparisons between uh, commercial tool and the free one. And then closing the October with Pragati, the 27th of October with advanced uh, tricks with uh, buttons and bookmarks in Power BI. So it will be pretty packed. And I would really like to welcome our today's guests. It's Mark. Probably you know him from Datamark, either blog, either order some swags, which are becoming popular. And Mark will talk today about external tools and what to do with them, how to do then I have to admit from my side, I'm using a Power BI documenter a lot and it's really helpful tool. So Mark, welcome. Nice Thank to you. have you here. Nice to that you decided to spend some time with us and share the knowledge. Sure, sure. I'm uh, happy to do that. So thanks for having me. Um, glad that I can, can be here and share uh, with you uh, about external tools if you are not familiar with it. Uh, what is it uh, and how you can create your own actually. Um, I think now's the time that I take over the screen share. Yep, you can take over. So cool. stage is yours. Enjoy. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So in a second, you should be able to see my screen. Um, so today I will talk to you about Power BI external tools. Uh, what is it? How do they work? How you can create your own, etc. So you might know uh, um, these three, uh, Dex Studio, Tableau Editor, and Alien Toolkit. These three are the most famous ones. Uh, and you're lucky that you uh, have uh, Daniel Otiker signed up for a new session about Tableau Editor 3. So that's the middle tool. Uh, so you might already know this, but uh, I will not spend too much time with it. I will do a very, very short demo about uh, Tableau Editor, but I use Tableau Editor 2 for this demo, as is the free version. Um, but these are three different types of external tools that we might all know and love. And um, today I will show you these. What is it? How do they work on the back end? But also, uh, how did I build my own external tool, uh, which I shared on my GitHub page and is all uh, available for you to download for free? And uh, how you can start creating your own, actually. Before you run into this, I will very shortly introduce myself. Um, my name is Mark. I'm working as a data analytics consultant at McCall in the Netherlands. We actually not only host it in the Netherlands, we also have a Lithuania or uh, an office in Lithuania and in Germany in uh, uh, Cologne. Um, I'm proud to be awarded for three years in a row already as data platform MVP in, uh, uh, and in spe specifically Power BI. And since this year, also fast track recognized solution architect. Uh, for Power BI. Um, other than that, I tend to combine my two biggest hobbies, which is Power BI and beer, which lead to the shirts with the where I transformed the Power BI logo in, into some beers. Um, and I'm regularly blogging on my own website about everything related to 
data and AI in Microsoft technology, but I can admit, uh, I think 99% of my blogs are about Power BI, uh, which you can find on data-mark.com. Um, so enough about me. Uh, let's have a look at what we what I will cover today. First of all, external tools. What is it? Um, then we will we'll run into analysis services in memory and why this matters for external tools. Um, as a third topic, building your own external tool, uh, then the documenting solution, and finally uh, the mobile documenter external tool itself. And I will show you how it works in practice. Um, so let's get started. First, what actually is an external tool? Um, you might already have a few of them in your top ribbon in Power BI. Here's a screenshot of mine where you have, for example, analyzed Excel connector, SQL profiler, uh, Power BI report builder, or the common ones, Dex Studio, ALM Toolkit, and Tableau Editor. Um, but what exactly is it? In fact, an external tool is a tool that allows you to connect to your data model. So it is third party tooling. It is not owned by Microsoft. It's third party tooling that is picking in on your data model that is built in Power BI. It is all depending on the new type of metadata that was released last year by Microsoft. And this metadata is the Tableau object model structure. Um, so it can have read and write capabilities to this Tableau object model. The Tableau object model is the definition of everything that's happening under the hood. So again, it's really most famous ones, Dex Studio, Tableau Editor, and ALM Toolkit. And I think out of these three, ALM Toolkit is the least known. Um, you might know this with a different name, being uh, a BISM Normalizer, which was a plugin to Visual Studio uh, when you, uh, where you developed your analysis services models. And as I always like to take some risks, I directly want to jump into a few demos and show you how these tools work in practice. So, you might know this data model, which is just a data model uh, from Arsdell, uh, the dashboard in a day sample that Microsoft created on their website. This data model uh, is just a nice uh, snowflake schema, nothing, nothing to worry about, about sales uh, products so on a certain location geography, and yeah, that's it, nothing special. Um, but I will use this for my demos today to show you how these external tools interact with it. For example, if I go to my external tools ribbon, I got a bunch of external tools here already. And what I can do easily is simply spin up Dex Studio from here. And by doing so, Dex Studio will open with an active connection to my data model. And of course, it will open on my other screen. So let me move it to the right place. Here we go. Um, and it will have an active connection. So actually, the tables that I see here on the left hand side are coming from my data model in Power BI. So again, we will see the manufacturer product, sales, etc. Um, you can see on the bottom here that it is connected to the local host. And this is the location where your Power BI data model is running at this moment. And here the GUID that we see on top is actually the database name that is running at this moment. Um, so you can directly spin up an uh, uh, um, for example, Dax Studio, well, let me do something similar with Tableau Editor. And as soon as we spin up Tableau Editor, I will show you uh, what you can do with the power of Tableau Editor uh, and, uh, for example, create a new measure in my Power BI data model. On the right hand side, we see a sales table that has uh, uh, two metrics in it sales prior year and sales total. Uh, and there's a percentage growth and some whatever bar means uh, measure. So in here, again, we see tables, we see uh, uh, translations if there are, uh, roles if there's role level security. So we have the USA and Canada as a role here. We can see all relationships that this model has and perspectives if there are. Um, but what you can do, for example, with Tableau Editor is let's create a new measure. So in my sales table, I'd like to create a new measure and I'd like to do that in the uh, display folder for sales. By doing a right click, I can simply click uh, create new and create measure. And in here, I can start typing uh, uh, my DAX expression actually. actually. So let me call this one average, and I want to call the, calculate the average of my sales table, and I want to use a column uh, revenue. So instead of creating a, a sum of sales, we now take an average. So far, so good. And what we can do is give it a name here. So we call this 
search. Nothing to worry about. We simply click validate. And what we'll see here is that it has a little question mark here, which is showing us that this is a new measure that is not deployed yet to Power BI. By simply clicking this save icon here, I will save this to Power BI. And you might have seen it appearing, but now I got a new measure here, which is this newly created measure. So I can use external tools to do read and write capabilities to my uh, data model. That is something that you can do with Tableau Editor. Um, and now I just wrote the measure myself. Uh, one of the differences to already spoil a little bit between Tableau Editor 2 and 3, I don't have any intelligence here. So I have to type in everything myself. Uh, there are no recommendations coming from the tool, which is actually a feature of Tableau Editor 3. But more about that in a later session by Daniel. I think he uh, can much better explain all the differences. Other features that you can you'll find for measures, for example, here on the bottom are things like uh, uh, the display folder, if it uh, resides in a display folder, format strings, you can change everything that is related to this measure here. If it is hidden or not, the name, uh, there's also an, uh, uh, a description field somewhere. So this helps you to quickly bulk edit and bulk create measures. Um, also for creating perspectives, for example, there you have to use Tableau Editor because creating perspectives is something that's not possible today with the Power BI desktop client. And a perspective is as much as creating a subset of content um, in a specific view of your data set. And please be aware, perspective is not a security object, but the perspective is creating a subset uh, where you can view at only a small portion of your data model. So for example, let me just create a new perspective and call this one demo. And what I can do is, for example, I want to have only my sales table in my perspective. So I can just, uh, well, actually I can drag and drop it in here and I can drop it in perspective. And now my sales table is part of my demo perspective. So in the future, I can easily connect to one perspective only instead of a full data set. And I will only see the sales table instead of all other tables. Well, this is a way how you can do these kind of things. Now you can create perspectives. Um, that is an example. Um, let's have a look at, for example, ALM Toolkit as a third external tool. Let's go, go back to um, uh, Power BI Desktop and spin up ALM Toolkit. What we will do now is the power of ALM Toolkit and combining it with Power BI Desktop and the Power BI service. If we open to, uh, ALM toolkit it will look like this. So we will get uh, asked what do what are the data models that we want to uh, compare. In other words, we have Power BI Desktop here as a source data set, and secondly, uh, we have a data set that is living in the Power BI service. So here we have the XML endpoint from a Power BI service. Let me show you where I got that. If I go to my Power BI workspace and I want to use an XML endpoint. I'm forced to have premium capacity because, or a premium per user workshop, oh. because XML endpoints are a premium feature. If I go into my data set settings here and I navigate to uh, a premium, I can copy here the XML endpoint. So let me just copy this and let me paste that in here. Once I click this drop down, I can select the data set. Uh, from this workspace. And I'm first asked, uh, first asked to sign in. So let me quickly sign in. And with single sign on. Yep, there we go. Um, so actually, what we can do, uh, let me compare it with the other one actually. So we have the same report already published in the Power BI service. And I want to compare my Power BI desktop file with the file that's already in the Power BI service. If I click OK now, it will run a comparison of the metadata. And it's comparing the metadata of my two Parvia models. And please note, it is only the data model that it's comparing. It is not doing the visuals or anything like that. So what we'll see here, for example, is that we have uh, the full model overview. So here we see the, the model itself, uh, where the import everything is set to import mode. Uh, we can see some expressions that we have here, which is actually the Power Query statement. 
And as you can see, there are differences in here. So in the right hand column, you can see that it's going to update this parameter because there is a difference. My Barbie desktop model has a lineage tag that does not exist in um, the already published model in the Parvia service. We can also see differences in the model itself. So here again, we have lineage tag as a difference. So almost everything is set to update. But for example, here we have a revenue average and revenue average does not exist on my source model. So it will delete this one. Well, actually I don't want this to happen, so I can set it to skip. The sales average measure that we just created does exist in part of a desktop, but not in the service, so it will create this one. Well, all these kind of things, that is what uh, uh, ALM Toolkit is capable of, of comparing the metadata of two different models. So what we can do now is uh, um, either report the differences and it will generate us an export in Excel of all these differences in, in this model. Something else that we can do is also we click validate selection. Um, uh, yeah, OK. Um, let me do a recompare of these two models. Let me just compare it with the other one, for example. The empty bar we have found. Also publish an empty model there, um, and there you can see that everything will be new that it's going to create. So everything will be created, and I don't want to remove this table, so let's set this to skip. Um, what you can do in the options menu is including perspectives or not, uh, including uh, role level security roles, um, and what we want to do, and a bunch more options, and what we want to do after deploying. Do we want to process the data set, so refresh the data set, uh, recalculate it, or uh, do we want to do, uh, uh, do we not want to do anything? Personally, I prefer to not process it, simply because I don't want effect to affect my end users after publishing it. So, um, let me just do a comparison again, because for some reason it disappeared. And as soon as we have the comparison, we validate the selection and it will show us like, OK, these are all the things that you're about to change. Uh, click OK. And I can either generate a script that will give us an XMLA script that we can run from any other tool or can check into a versioning system like Azure DevOps, or I can just click Update. And yes, I'm sure I want to update the targets. Now what's happening now is that it successfully deployed all my metadata. As I didn't ask Parvia to process my data set, um, my data set is not refreshed yet. Though if I go into this empty PBI Excel, this was my target, and I click on edit, I can see the full data model in here. Um, so I do have my sales table now with uh, uh, all my metrics in it, the display folder, and the sales average. So everything is published uh, to the Parvia service. With this, you can easily deploy your Parvia models. Um, so this is the tool called ALM Toolkit. Um, three different examples of what you can do with uh, um, three different external tools. Um, we use the ALM Toolkit and XML endpoint. We push the measure to the, and we, actually we did it to the Parvia desktop and we can do the same to the Parvia service. Um, and we created a new measure uh, um, in our Power BI model uh, by using an external tool, in this case, Sabra Editor. So how do you get all these tools? These were three different tools that you can install manually by just the next, next finish installer if, if you download them online. There are a bunch more tools that require admin permissions and you need to download them all one by one to your computer, which can be a pain, especially if you need to do it one by one with the amount of tools that's out there that can take you a while. Luckily, there's a guy called Mike Carlo, uh, the guy behind Parvia Tips, and he decided to create a tool to install external tools. This is called Business Ops. It's this tool. Um, and in this tool, you can find and scroll to a bunch of external tools that's out there and easily select a few of them and, in, and install them all in one go. You also take care of the permissions on the back end and that all the connections to the Power BI set uh, will be set correctly. Um, if you want to install them, I encourage you to use this business ops installer. That will save you a lot of time. Um, 
So what, what's there out there now? Well, there are a bunch of external tools that are created by other MVPs or people that, that we know from the community. For example, Eric Swenson, an MVP from Denmark, he created an Excel connector uh, uh, to connect Power BI report builder, uh, so for paginated reports, or even connect Tableau to your Power BI data model. Um, SQL BI also created an analyze in Excel. Um, personally, I really love the one by created by uh, Davy Sang. Um, he created the DAX beautifier. So all your DAX expressions were run through the um, DAX formatter from uh, SQL BI. And all your DAX expressions will be formatted in a, a nice and easy way. So they are easy to read. Um, other than that, there's a bunch more out there. Uh, let's have a look at them. I, we have some time left at the end. Um, so and let's now talk about another service in memory and why this matters for uh, uh, external tools. Well, actually, if we look at Power BI and if you open Power BI Desktop, and you open your task manager of your computer, you see that analysis services is running on the back end. Analysis services, a good old Microsoft SQL Server analysis services is running as part of Power BI um, and is sharing this metadata structure that we now have in Power BI. So, since September 2020, uh, Power BI is using the same tabular object model structure um, as analysis services already did for many years, uh, which is a JSON file actually. It's an open format. So if you unzip a Power BI file, uh, please know this is unsupported, but you can unzip Power BI files. Um, there you will find your data model. This will be the same as uh, um, if you have a model.bim file from analysis services and you open that, you also see this structure. So if you serve a database or model, then the table structures, relationships, perspectives, cultures, roles, and annotations. So all this defines the structure of your uh, data model in Power BI. And this is important to know once we try to connect and what we will see in the metadata of Power BI if, if we connect an external tool to Power BI. So how actually do you build these external tools? Well, in fact, it exists of three parts. Three parts, which is, of course, building the application itself. Um, creating your icon is a really important aspect um, and integrating it with Power BI Desktop. When I talk about how I created my ex own external tool, I decided to go for PowerShell. I'm not a real application developer. I don't write any line C Sharp or .NET or whatever. So PowerShell was already good, uh, uh, um, already good enough for me to do what I, what I wanted to do, uh, and also um, difficult enough for me. So I just went for PowerShell and uh, simply because I only wanted to automate some tasks. I'm not really writing something back to Power BI. I only want to read from Power BI. So whatever language you prefer, you can uh, uh, create your tool and let it connect with Power BI. And you connect with two different parameters, which is the server and the database that we've seen in the DAX Studio uh, application, where we have the local host on the bottom and the database name on top. Those are the two parameters that will be passed by Power BI as soon as you click the uh, external tools ribbon on uh, or, or the button on top. Um, I also mentioned you need to, uh, to have your logo, your icon. And this is really important simply because without an icon, it will not show up in the external tools ribbon of Power BI. So you really need to create this one yourself and it is necessary to have this. Um, other than that, there's also something else that we need, and that's what I'm going to show you right now. Um, so let me go to the next slide, and that's the integration file um, for your for Power BI Desktop. In order to get your application in Power BI Desktop, you need to put a specific JSON file on a predefined location. This location is actually your program files uh, folder, so here you need uh, uh, admin permissions to get these files in here. And it's actually program files, comma files, Microsoft shared, and there you will see a Power BI desktop folder with external tools in it. And there you see all the external tools that you have installed. For me, that's a set of eight or nine or 10 items. And these 10 items all have this PBI tool.json file. Let me just show you one and let me open, for example, my own and show you what this looks like. 
enlarge it a little bit. So it exists of a few parameters that we need to set. First of all, the version of the tool, so it is up to yourself. We give it a name and a description if we like, um, but then we need to define the application that we are going to run and where it is located. In my case, I run the application PowerShell, but as an argument, I pass on the location where the script is that I want to execute. So here you see the location of the script. And finally, in the end, another argument that I want to pass is the server and database. And these are the two variables that I get from Power BI Desktop. So as soon as I click this button in the top ribbon here, these are the two parameters that I pass to my Power BI PowerShell script. And finally, on the bottom, uh, we have the uh, icon data. So that is defining the icon, and that is in a base64 format. And base64 is a code based format for images. Um, so this defines a tool. If we open a random other uh, external application, PBI tool to JSON, for example, let's open the one from Dex Studio, you'll see a similar setup. Here they also pass, sorry. Here they also pass a server and database and an icon and, and everything is similar here. Um, so this is also an integration as an external tool. These three elements define the integration between Power BI and your external tool. Um, so let's have a look at what I actually built as an external tool and um, what steps I went through and how this thing actually works. So let's first talk a little bit about documentation. Um, I think most of you in this call are developers or at least familiar with Power BI Desktop and build a, a data model in Power BI Desktop. If you do this from a uh, consultancy side like I do, uh, an often asked question is, hey, um, do we also deliver documentation when we uh, deliver our solutions? Um, and actually, if I hand over a project to my colleague or to the client, I often see people telling me, hey, I they told me, I was told that there was documentation. Well, actually not. And personally, I hate writing documentation. I prefer to jump onto the next project and get my hands on the data model, build a stunning, a stunning report again. So when I run this in the past as a, a Kahoot quiz, like most of the audience told me like documentation is not overrated, but we personally don't spend much, uh, I don't spend much time on it and others don't, don't do it either. So I, I went for it uh, before I created my own external tool. I dropped on Twitter uh, a poll and I asked people like, if you deliver a Power BI solution, which results in, in a shared data set, does it come with proper documentation? Well, as you can see, the majority of the responses is about no, what is documentation? Uh, and uh, also a large portion of it told me like, only if I have some time left. And Adgar, another MVP that is uh, from Denmark, um, answered to me like, you're missing an option if it is prioritized. I always ask for it to be part of the task, but too often it is not prioritized. Even though clients pay me for advice, documentation is sadly one of those uh, they of most often ignore. And that's very true. That's also what I experience from uh, working with different clients. So I still think that especially for shared data set, documentation is really important. So if I currently document my Power BI models, yes, I do, but I don't write lengthy documents with lots of pages and everything, uh, and I don't put something manually together. Um, it is not about every nitty gritty detail, but it's more high over that I want to provide at least something. So especially for handing over projects, I personally really uh, uh, prefer to have documentation. Also, if a colleague hands over something to me, so there I uh, uh, like to have some documentation, but not a pile of paper like you have here, but please do it in a digital format, something that I can read through in a few minutes and easily see what it's all about. Simply because, um, yeah, really, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, so if I look at what I want to document, in fact, I want to document power query. I want to document the relations. Uh, in the model relationships, the DAX expressions, but also the column and table properties. And even if I can, I would also aim to, to document the uh, the report, but unfortunately, 
that is not possible at this moment. The terminal object model and everything that is passed through uh, 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 and readable for an external tool at this moment is limited to the data model. You cannot read anything about the uh, report itself. So things like page rules, bookmarks, or page navigations, or the, gen the report in general is not possible uh, to report on. So what I did is creating an external tool that uh, uh, generates a report, another Power BI report, about my Power BI report. So it shows me what does my uh, table structure look like? How, how does this, this model look like? What measures do I have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So before I open that, let me quickly open something that I always call my crap file. And it's called crap file for a reason. And of course I didn't copy that one. Let me find it quickly. Um, this crap file is a, a data model that um, doesn't have any best practices in it. And that's the reason why I like to run the documentation based on this crap file. Simply so you can directly see uh, um, what it does in case there are um, some failures in it or some things that can be improved in it. Um, so here we have the crypt file. I'm opening it right now in Power BI Desktop. So give it a moment. As we all know that the Power BI Desktop spinning up uh, can take a little moment. Um, so in the meantime, let's move on to explain you what this model documenter is doing. Um, this model documenter is actually benefiting from the dynamic management views. And dynamic management views is uh, our queries that return information about model objects, server operations, server health. So think about uh, um, everything related to metadata of my Power BI data model. Um, there are, in general, four different types of the DMVs, dynamic management views, being database schema, database model. Uh, discover operations where you can discover active sessions in Power BI. So if you run discover operations through a published Power BI data set, you can see everyone that's interacting with your report at this moment. TM schema, which stands for tabular model schema. And these schema stands for MDX multidimensional schema. So everything built in Power BI is most likely TM schema. Although uh, I can tell you that sometimes uh, MD schema also works. There's a little, and overlap between TM and MD schema, dynamic management views. Um, preferably, if I want to do a quick analysis, I run uh, uh, these kind of operations from DAX Studio. Why do I use DAX Studio here? Uh, well, pretty simple because um, DAX Studio has a library of all dynamic management views in it, and I can simply click and, and generate them. So. Let's move into that, and uh, I'll do that with my crap file. So uh, what I'm going to do is show you this crap file, and it's crap for a reason because it's the most ugly report that I ever created, and not only ugly in the report visualization, but also the data model. So for example, I got a many-to-many -many or an, uh, a bidirectional relationship here. I got a many-to-many -many here. Um, a lot of things that you shouldn't do, and I intentionally did that here to show you uh, uh, in a later stadium what the model documenter is doing with this. So first, let me spin up Dex Studio again as an external tool, connect it to the scrap file, and show you what we can do, for example, by uh, getting an overview of all the uh, uh, tables that we have in this model. Of course, we already see them here, um, but here on the bottom, we have a tab called DMV, and with that, we go into the dynamic management views. Let me just search for table here. And as you can see, um, we have the TM schema tables, table storage, table permissions, and a lot of different types. And we also have a DB schema. So let's first run the DB schema and show you the differences. If I run the DB schema, I see a lot of tables, more than I actually have on my data model. And that's because all the uh, dynamic management view tables itself, so all the metadata tables, are also visible here. And in this case, I only want to see the, the tables of my Power BI data model. So I go for the TM schema. Let's rerun it. And what I can see is all the tables that I have here. So I got my sales order header, for example. Uh, I got a bunch of local daytime template tables, product model, um, product description, product category, product, customer address, customer. So I see all these different tables here. Um, 
So that helps me to understand uh, um, how this thing actually works and what tables I have in here, which are hidden and which are not. But for example, what's interesting to also see is if you use partitions um, or if you use some sort of, uh, um, uh, or you want to see the power, the power query behind it, you want to search, for example, for queries, but you only have the query groups. But funny enough, a partition in Power BI Desktop is similar to the table. In Power BI Desktop, you cannot have multiple partitions in a single table. So if I, for example, have my sales order header here, I can directly see the uh, Power Query expression that is associated with it. So I can see the power query expression here. If it is a DAX expression, for example, for the local date table templates, I can also see them here. So it generates a calendar table from 2015. Um, everything is visible to me here, and I can read all the metadata and what Power BI is doing on the back end. Same goes for measures, for example. Uh, so we have the TM schema measures. Let's run that. And I can see all my measures that are in this uh, data model and nicely formatted or everything in one row or a failing measure, which is intentionally broken. I already named it broken measure. Um, and as you can see, there's also a flag somewhere. Let me find it. Is it in the state? Here it has a state. And if it is a valid measure, it has state one. If it is a broken measure, it has state five. So we can actually trace if the measure is valid or not. For well, invalid measures, will be directly visible from the metadata. Um, if you use per perspectives, you can also look at, uh, for example, uh, which tables or measures are available in perspectives. So let's have a look at columns in a perspective. So here we have a perspective table, and we only have one perspective, but we don't know yet what's in here. Um, but, but for example, we can also see what measures are in a perspective. And here we have two measures that are part of a perspective. So here we need to join some tables because we have the measure ID, but we don't know to which uh, perspective it belongs. So here we have the perspective uh, ID, and this is what we can link to the perspective table itself. So TM schema perspectives, which I call test perspective. So by combining all these tables, we get a lot of information about our data model. Finally, one interesting thing that I want to show you is, for example, the roles. So if we look at roles, we have something called discover Power BI roles. So let me execute that, and you'll see that it starts failing. Discover roles is a discover operation that only works when you connect to Power BI Premium or directly to the Power BI service in some other way. So over the XML endpoint. So there's also a TM schema roles, and that helps me to understand the different roles that we have in the data model. So here we have four different roles, um, and all these roles actually uh, um, do not show me anything about what the filter is behind these roles, because that is again covered in a different table. So for example, if my table, uh, I believe it is in table permissions, so here we see uh, the, the, the expression that is used for the role in order to filter the table. So for the role bike, we see it say that product category needs to be one or uh, the name should be bikes. So we can get everything out of it. As I already mentioned, I'm rather lazy, uh, lazy and efficient than doing everything over and over again. So I went for it and I created my own external tool um, and I wanted to create something that runs on every computer. So not only me, but also my colleagues can benefit from it. Uh, and why not even more people? So I made it open source and put everything on GitHub. Um, as I already mentioned, I started doing this with PowerShell. I uh, uh, created a PowerShell script which retrieves the server and database information from Power BI Desktop. It dumps this information in a temporary location as I'm spinning up a new Power BI instance. And this new Power BI instance will generate the documentation for me. Um, so I temporarily dump it there. And don't worry, I'm not creating a shitload of data on your computer because every time it, you click the button, it will overwrite the previous version. Um, it automatically downloads the template report from GitHub if, if it is not on your computer. Uh, if it already is on your computer, it will use the template from your computer and it will open this template. So these are the four tasks that I'm 
executing from PowerShell. Um, there are a few learnings that I want to share you as well, and those are, those are the learnings by building this external tool that I took me a long time. Capturing the server and database parameters um, and the exact format, how that is uh, 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 viewed here in this section in the arguments. In the end, I just stole it from uh, uh, some other external tool. I looked out that they did it and leveraged the same setup. Um, basically, now it is very well documented, but when I created my external tool, there was no documentation on this yet. So I had to find out everything myself. Um, if we go back for a second to this one, you can also see that in a path here, I use a double backslash. If you do this on a normal Windows machine, um, this double backslash is not accepted if you do this in your uh, file browser. But funny enough, it was a requirement here. With a single backslash, it starts failing. Also here you see the same thing, also a double backslash. Uh, basically because this is also an escape character. Um, what I learned also was more general PowerShell. I'm not a developer once again, so um, PowerShell in general, I can do some things with it, um, but yeah, I wish to do more with it. And on-demand editing of the Power BI file is not possible. So therefore, I temporarily dumped this connection file in JSON as a workaround, uh, as that was one of the tasks that I did with the PowerShell, the temporary dump, as you cannot on-demand pass this parameter into a new Power BI instance. Um, so what I uh, improved in the last version, um, it creates a folder for you if it does not exist, so to keep everything together, uh, it has a little startup menu where you can choose between two export types. So I'm not only supporting Power BI as an export now, but also an Excel template. So if you have a uh, 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 wish to export all your information to Excel, you can do that as well. So let me let me just demo it to you how this works. Let me go back to the scrap file. Here we have it. Uh, we have external tool, and in the top ribbon here, I got. Uh, no, not the timer, this one. I got the model documenter. And if I click this button, uh, a PowerShell window will pop up, and that's of course on my other screen, which welcomes me to the Power BI documenter tool. It already shows me on the screen, this is your local host, and this is your database. Um, so these are your connection, uh, this is your connection information. Then it asks me to choose one of the below options to export my model documentation. Option one is open documentation in Power BI or option two in Excel. Personally, I prefer Power BI, so let me just hit, and, uh, hit one and click enter. And as you can see, it directly opens a new Power BI instance. While the script was running, it already dumped the, the temporary file on the location for me, which was just in a split of a second. Um, all that uh, was done while I was just reading what was on the screen and while it was opening. As I'm opening a template, it asked me the location of this temporary file. If you installed the external tool through business ops, you can just click OK. If you decided to manually uh, put it in a location and maybe even put it in a different location, then you might need to fill this manual location parameter. I will just click load now because I uh, put everything in the same location. And what it will ask me is native database queries. OK. Um, I got a, a setting turned on now that asks me if I can execute queries. This is one of the known limitations or irritations that this current version has. Uh, more about that later, but I need to click run for every query. Um, you can prevent this from happening, actually. Other than that, I'm connecting to my local host, to my local server where my Power BI instance is running now. So my local host is on my local machine, so I need to authenticate to it. I can do this with Windows credentials. I don't need to pass uh, server credentials or anything. So actually, I need to just click run for five or six times now. Um, if you want to prevent this from happening, there is a setting in Power BI Desktop where you can just say, um, uh, let me just show you it. There is a setting in Power BI Desktop, and I'll also explain you what just happened with the other error that popped up. Um, and this setting is, I believe, 
there is something that asks you if you want to run a query. However, require user approval for a database and native database queries. Let me turn that off. And the other query error that occurred was about uh, privacy levels. I do a few joints of tables in the back end, and if they have different privacy levels, it do not allow me to join these tables. Um, funny enough, I will just ignore privacy levels for now uh, and click apply once more, and it will start loading all data, and now it should succeed. These are actually the two known issues that most people bump into using this tool. This is something that unfortunately keeps going back and there's nothing for me to script in some way that uh, these settings will be set correctly before you open the tool. Um, let's go back to the outcome of this. Uh, it opens a new version of uh, or a new instance of Power BI where you first got introduced to what this is actually. And in all the different tabs, I walk you through everything that this data model contain, it has in it. So here we see all the different tables. Um, and if I just click sales order header, for example, I can see the Power Query expression here. It tells me what type of table it is. So it is a Power Query table. But for example, I saw some of these local date tables here, which is a DEX generated table. I can see the columns in here and what's encoding it used in, in storage. Um, if I unselect everything, it also shows me the grand total of 23 tables of which 12 can be deleted potentially because these 12 tables are all the local date tables and the date table template tables. They are auto generated by Power BI. By turning off this feature, you, the, the, those will be uh, deleted. Same goes for calculated tables uh, or calculated columns, um, something you should prevent as much as possible uh, if you can use a measure instead of a calculated column. So there are 72 calculated columns in this case. So this tells you all about the uh, model itself. So if I just go get rid of all the DEX generated tables, you can see no, no uh, uh, calculated columns are left and I only have this left. So I only see the tables that I imported myself. Let's have a look at measure expressions. So I got three different tables where some measures are located. Uh, I got one display folder and I can search for a specific measure name. Um, as I already demoed you in DAX Studio, one of my measures was broken. So here it is. It also needs attention because I put, you know, I got one measure that needs attention and it was also a red flag here like, hey, this measure is broken. Um, I also got two measures which actually do have a description field for my end user. So here it is all good. This measure is valid. It works. It has a description, all according to best practices. Um, while these measures are actually working, they are valid, um, but they don't have a description. And I personally really think that a measure should have a description if you are documenting them. In general, they should have it. That's my personal opinion. But especially if you document them, please fill in the description field. Uh, description fields can easily be filled from the model view in Power BI Desktop or uh, do it with external tools like Tableau Editor. Um, so you, I'm actually sh showing them here like, hey, these, these are lacking a description, uh, how many are hidden, for example, um, but also the all the relationships. So here I display the relationships in this data model of which this is a security relationship, which has the bidirectional filtering for security turn on. Uh, and here we have too many to many relationships. As many to many is not a best practice, uh, I flag them in red as well. You see that this one is a little bit grayed out because this one is inactive. This one is actually active. So as it is active, uh, I think this one needs attention. So we have two which need attention and eight relationships that are bidirectional, uh, of which some of them are actually um, uh, one to one relationships. So I don't flag them as one to one. It's OK. Uh, I can also easily use this view to see all my relationships that are coming or going to the product table, for example. So everything that relates to product, I can see it in here. So I got my day table, of course. Uh, uh, this is my product category, product model. Uh, so I got a bunch of tables that are connecting to it. Finally, we also have the real-level security overview. 
Um, so which roles do we have? Uh, what is the filter expression of this role? And is it the valid expression or is it failing? And if there is a description, you can see it here as well. If it has an error message, it is also displayed here. Um, then about what is the model documenter is giving you as an export. Exactly the same information will be available to you in the Excel format, um, but the Power BI format is personally my preference as I can publish it to the same workspace as my report. So we got everything in one place for my end users. Um, let's have a quick look uh, with a little time that we've left at known limitation or my personal irritations. Um, as I'm using PowerShell, uh, I have to deal with PowerShell execution policies. Some people run into this that they are not allowed to execute this script and they have to change execution policies. Execution policies is something you have to set in PowerShell yourself. It's not something that I can do for you. Um, privacy levels, as you've seen when I run the demo, uh, this might block the loading. If you change it to ignore privacy levels or always ignore, you're good to go. The native database queries, I just switched it off. Um, native database queries is actually what uh, uh, we require to click run every time. Um, you need admin approval to install this tool. Uh, it's a bit obvious. I don't think I can lift this limitation ever, but um, yeah, it might hold people back from using it. It requires this uh, MS OLAP provider to be installed uh, mainly for an Excel template. An Excel template cannot be auto downloaded at this moment. You have to manually download that and tell, tell the tool where it is. And there is no support for live connections. So in the two demos that I showed you, the data model and report were in the same file. If I connect to an existing data model in the Power BI service, um, I cannot run this model documenter. And this is actually something that I really want to solve in the next version. Um, the model documenter is about a year old now. I think it's close to a year. In November, it should be a year. Um, so what's currently missing? Uh, in the beginning, I did a few releases. So I'm now at version 1.2.1. Um, that was mainly bug fixes and some new uh, quick uh, quick uh, uh, enhancements. What I'm hoping to add soon is support for roles and expressions. Uh, well, that's actually their uh, roles, but also for the um, not only for role level security roles, but also for uh, um, object level security roles. Um, perspectives, which is not currently included. The automated download for the Excel template, and what I hope to add later, is support for live connected models and an easier installer to um, install them currently manually or through business ops. I really would love to have like a next next finish installer where you just open the installer, click next 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 finish, and you're done. Um, I already know a way to support live connected models. Um, but it's mainly my side, my side gig here, uh, so I really need to find time to work on this. Um, so as soon as I found the time, I will continue building the, this tool and make a better and newer version of it. So from now on, I think that everyone should be capable to deliver at least some documentation to their solutions. If you deliver some documentation, it will be easier for your end user to understand what your model is about. But not only that, uh, also easier hand over to your colleagues, or if you finish a project, hand over to your stakeholders. With that, I'd like to do a short wrap up. Um, I truly believe that external tools are really valuable to everyone's developing experience in Power BI. External tools are depending on this analysis service metadata format that we know as Terra Object Model. It allows you to develop and interact with your data model with third party tools like. Tableau Editor, Deck Studio, even Visual Studio, uh, if you prefer that tool, or anything else uh, that can connect to this Tableau Object Model. And it opens up tons of opportunities for you and me to contribute to Power BI, to come up with new new development experiences or anything that ben that we can benefit from as a community. With a model documenter as an external tool, it allows me personally to be lazy or call it efficient by generating this documentation, not conducting the documentation every time over and over again manually. It opens up new opportunities to easier hand over my solutions and deliver it to my clients. And it is super powerful 
to my experience, for self-service purposes and end users. So if I build a data model and the model will be used for self-service, um, users can use this model documentation to uh, understand what the model is about and how this works. Having that said, um, I'd like to mention one last thing. If you go to my website slash model documenter, or you just go to data-mark.com and in the top ribbon, you'll find a button model documenter. Um, you will find everything about this tool, uh, how to get it, how to install it, um, how to copy my code and uh, fork my uh, GitHub li library if you like and build your own. Um, and of course, I'd like to open up for uh, for some questions. So if there are any, please. I, I have there. a first question Excellent. actually. Should. So, so uh, as I was using it quite quite a lot, and it's a great tool. Just one question: Do you plan to support documenting uh, models which are already published without downloading Power BI Desktop? Yeah, that is actually the live support for models, and uh, um, that support for live connected models. That if I got that working, uh, then it works for analysis services for already published data models for everything that we can have in the Power BI service. So I, I managed somehow in some options, uh, do it manually throughout your uh, documenter template, mm -hmm. uh, push through Power Query, but it's sim simply not automatic and uh, I love the tool. And the other question is, is there an option to document multiple reports in the same document report? Um, no, not at this moment. Because that requires to do some sort of looping of all the queries on the back end. Yeah. At this moment, it's not in there yet. But uh, as I made everything open source, feel free to change it. Uh, my main focus now, uh, as it's the most heard feedback, uh, if I find the time, is working on that live connected models. Um, but the impact of that is quite large, as I need to change the entire back end of the tool. And I cannot benefit of the dy dynamic management queries, uh, dynamic management views anymore. For models that are running on your local machine, you can use these DMVs, but uh, for live connected models, they will not work. Yeah. So there, I need to uh, uh, make a big shift to another backend. Good. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a perk that uh, uh, someone else already did a big chunk of work for me another MVP where he just shared his code and, and I can reuse that, um, but I need to integrate it because I think it's like 60, 70 percent of what I need. So uh, uh, the other chunk still needs to be uh, added. OK, that's the questions from my side. Anybody else would like to unmute, type, write, whatever? Hey, Mark, uh, this is Kirill. How are you doing? Hey. Um, quick question. So on the ALM toolkit, um, it is only one way, right? From source to destination. You can't like go both ways. No, that's true. Yeah, the only thing you can do is like switch it from uh, switch the source and destination location and run it again. Uh, okay. But you cannot say in one run like, OK, I want to copy this from target back to source and this I want to publish from source to target. Right. right. So it's 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 pretty much all the time from the desktop to the service. Yeah, but you can do the same thing um, if you, for example, want to uh, compare two Power BI models that are already published, that are mm -hmm. living in different workspaces. Or where it can also be really powerful is if you have an analysis services uh, data set and you mm -hmm. want to migrate to a, to a Power BI data set. OK, OK. What, the, the, what I actually did from Power BI Desktop, publish it to the service. The only thing that I did is I published an empty data set to the Power BI service. Okay. And as long as the data set exists, I can deploy everything to it. So what I could do is have an LS services uh, um, do the comparison and then publish everything from an LS service into my Power BI data model. OK, makes sense. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, then uh, I think we can close it up. Yeah, doesn't seem like there's uh, any other questions that we 
quickly peek in the chat if there's anything there that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, then uh, let me just take over the final slides. Sure. I'll stop sharing. There you go. OK, I hope you can see it. Uh, this is just uh, a reminder for uh, the upcoming um, talks that we're going to have uh, and uh, the, the upcoming meetings. Uh, so um, of course, let me uh, let me say first uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for this uh, really exciting presentation. Uh, and I'm I'm sure that uh, many of uh, many of the one uh, the people that connected today are pretty excited about this and then going to try it from now on because. Uh, I uh, I can just say for myself that uh, just like you, documentation is not my favorite part. So uh, it's definitely gonna <laughs> gonna be uh, something that that will be used uh, thoroughly. Um, so cool. thanks for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel feel free everyone um, to check out the recordings. Uh, this will of course be uploaded to YouTube. Check uh, anything that you uh, didn't catch uh, doing this presentation and uh, you can you can join um, if you didn't do that yet the uh, Power BI meetup group and uh, you can connect to the next meetings uh, on the 13th of October. Um, Augustine already mentioned it uh, that uh, Ferenc is going to uh, talk about XML write endpoints and uh, on the 20th of October Daniel is uh, going to talk about uh, boosting Power BI productivity with Tabula Editor, which we heard about today a little bit as well. OK. That's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much again, and uh, hope you have a, a great day, great evening, uh, depending on where you are. Cool. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.